Aloha, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Thinking Things Through, Critical Thinking for Critical Times. I'm your host, Michael Sukoff. We are pleased to have with us today, Dr. Steve Masek, Professor and Chair of the Department of Communication and Media Studies at North Central College in Naperville, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. Steve received his PhD at the University of Minnesota in Cultural Studies with a focus on film and media studies. He's the author of Urban Nightmares, The Media, The Right, and The Moral Panic Over the City, a critical analysis of media representations of American cities and the urban poor in the 1980s and 90s. He's also a member of Project Censored, a media, sorry, a media watchdog group, and co-editor of their 2022 volume, State of the Free Press, an annual publication that discusses their research and findings on the most censored stories of the year. And uh, some of our viewers, listeners uh, may already know that we previously had three of Steve's colleagues from Project Center, Censor on this show to discuss their work. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks so much for having me, Michael. You're welcome. Now let's uh, dive right in here. Um, now, as many of our viewers and listeners may already know, Representatives from many countries around the world, as well as from corporations and non-governmental organizations, non-NGOs, are meeting right now at the Global Climate Change Conference in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. One of the major topics they're discussing is the vast disparity in carbon or CO2 emissions between the nations of the so-called Global North and the Global South. And this is in the context of the growing heating of the Earth's oceans and atmosphere due to human-caused climate change. Now, Project Censored has been engaged in very important research on this critical issue. issue. Uh, Steve, could you please briefly summarize Project Censored's research on this and talk specifically about why the corporate mass media are under-reporting this story? Sure, so um, every year, and your, your viewers may remember this, every year Project Censored assembles a list of the top 25 underreported or overlooked stories of the year. Um, and we publish this list as part of a book, a yearbook that's published by Seven Stories Press and the Censored Press. We now have an imprint, a unique imprint, Seven, uh, Censored Press uh, within Seven Stories Press. And um, over the past few years, many of the stories that have made it onto the list of most crucial underreported or ignored stor stories ignored or underreported by the corporate media have had to do with global climate change. And um, in last year's book, State of the Free Press uh, 2022, um, the number four story on the list had to do with um, the fact that climate debtor nations have colonized the atmosphere. And this related to a study that was published in uh, the journal, Lancet journal, uh, Planetary Health, by an economic anthropologist who looked at um, um, which countries are most responsible for the carbon that's that is um, it, that's made its way into the atmosphere and that is responsible um, for global climate change? And he concluded that 98% of the carbon that um, that is responsible for for changes in in global climate uh, emanated from the advanced industrialized countries of Europe, the United States, uh, Canada, and then you know parts of Asia. And um, these would be the countries of the global north, right? The countries of the so global called. north. And, and then, could you just please uh, tell us what climber debt it debtor nations are for our so viewers a climate so his he came up with the idea of climate debtor nations because he he sort of started with the premise that um, all of all the nations of the, the 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 atmosphere is the property of all the nations in the earth of all the people on the earth right of every country on the planet um but that some countries have polluted that atmosphere disproportionately more than others and so um climate debtor nations um are, are nations that have under polluted or under contributed carbon to to to, to the atmosphere right. um and uh and and so 
the, the nations of the global south are overwhelmingly the 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 climate debtor the climate debtor nations the nations who have under polluted and the countries of the global north are the ones who have you know who have contributed disproportionately to global climate change so right. the so the united states according to his calculations um uh you know had 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 was sort of contributed 40% in excess of what it was entitled to in terms of you know our population and so on to um, to the total amount of carbon um, in the atmosphere whereas a country um, like countries like India and China um, uh, had had dramatically under contributed to especially India had dramatically under contributed to the total amount of carbon in the atmosphere now this is a pretty sensational story there are lots of discussions of you know of what it, of what's res been responsible for the total amount of carbon in the atmosphere we all know it's human uh, human activity whether agriculture or industrial but this is the first effort to really parse out responsibility um, on a nation on a, uh, on a national basis for global climate change and it was it went completely underreported in yes. the corporate media. Um, it was independent media outlets like In These Times, which is, uh, I'm happy to say, uh, an investigative journalism uh, magazine that's published out of Chicago yes. um, that really drew attention to this. There were some occasional mentions of it um, in the scientific press, but um, but um, but not really a lot of coverage by the big corporate media. Right. Now, I want to ask you, if you don't mind my interrupting, sure. why do you and or Project Censored think this is the case based on your research? So this is a great question. And it is it's you know, you know it, it's one of the things that puzzles us right, at Pos Pro Project Censored. We know that that, um, in, you know, meteorologists, environmental climate, climate scientists, other kinds of scientists have known about the phenomenon of global climate change and have known that human being, human activity um, has been responsible for bringing yes. about this, this global climate change for quite some time. Um, but the question is, why hasn't the corporate media reported on it and reported on it adequately? And I think any explanation has to start with an acknowledgement of the institutional organization of the corporate media. The yes. corporate media are in business by and large, not to serve the public interest, but to serve the fiduciary interests of their shareholders, right? To, they're right. in business to make money. They are profit-making media for the most part. And um, so they have, um, you know, like any private business, they have a they have a, a board of directors um, whose job it is to make sure that the company makes money. And like a lot of g giant corporations, big media conglomerates have board of directors that include people who also sit on the boards of other companies. And yes. just to give you an example, these are what are called interlocking directorates. Yes. And just to give you a quick example, a company like Comcast, which you know is parent company of NBC, um, you know, MSNBC, CNBC, Telemundo, so it, it owns a lot of news outlets, um, has on its board of directors people who also serve on the board of directors of Dow DuPont, which is a major manufacturer, right, of, of petrochemicals, you know, agricultural chemicals yeah. and so on, that has ties to the fossil fuel industry. Um, uh, Deloitte, which is a major accounting company that, uh, that does work with all of the major um, big big oil and, and fossil fuel companies, um, you know, various banks, including Bank of New York, that lend money to fossil fuel companies. So their their interests um, are, you know, they're directly connected to companies that are involved in fossil fuels. Um, and, and so it makes perfect sense to me that they would not maybe want um, uh, reporters working for, say, NBC or CNBC, draw, you know, paying too close attention to this issue. Beyond that, right, it's not, it's not simply, and of course, 
people on the board of directors do not like get on the phone and talk to editors um, and say, why did you cover that story? That doesn't happen very often, yeah. but they hire the right people um, as producers, for example, or, you know, uh, who, who know which stories are, are, are acceptable and which ones might get them in trouble. And those, and those producers or senior producers or directors then hire the reporters who cover the stories. And so, um, Beyond that, the fact is that every all the commercial media in this country, virtually all of it is advertising subsidized. They depend on um, advertisements as a major source of revenue. So most newspapers, um, you know, any place you go in the country, 70 to 80 percent of their revenue come directly from advertisements um, broadcast. Uh, you know, broadcast over the air, terrestrial uh, television and radio depends 100% on advertising to pay the bills. 100% of the revenues come from advertising. Cable, right. it's it's like 90%. Right. And fossil fuel companies, companies like BP and Exxon are major advertisers. And no company that owns, you know, several different uh, news networks like like Comcast does uh, can afford to alienate this powerful constituency yeah. that is um, taking out the ads and paying for the commercial spots yeah. that pay the bills yeah. uh, for now, their company. Now, I'd like to segue to a related issue. Um, Project Sensors Research, as I understand it, also talks about the millions of dollars that are being spent on subsidizing the fossil fuel industry itself. And, and who is responsible for this funding? Can you say more about this? Yeah, so this is a really striking story that's going to be in the, I can't tell you where it's going to be in the, in the, uh, in, on the upcoming top 25 list, right. but in December, December 6th, I believe is the official publication and, date. Uh, could we please show the cover of that oh, uh, sure. book? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. you can keep can, going, can, Steve. Yeah. So, so in um, in in uh, in December, I think of uh, you know in, a, in about a month or so, um, this book, State State of the Free Press, uh, twenty twenty three, will be published, and the new top twenty five list of underreported stories will be included in that. And I helped to co-edit that particular chapter of the book. Uh -huh. And one of the stories that is very high up. I'm, I'm not going to tell you exactly where it is, it has to do with a, a report that was issued by the IMF about the, the sheer amount of money that governments spend subsidizing fossil fuels. And yeah. their fossil fuels, fossil fuel industry is subsidized to the tune of $11 million, right? Like a, a, a minute, um, uh, right? Um, which, is, which is stunning. And who is and, who is paying and, these subsidies? Can you give us a so couple it's, it's, of examples? It's it's, it's, it's um, I mean the 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 report you know referenced the tax breaks that that you know companies that engage in new drilling um, uh, get from get from uh, governments the um, you know the 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 free rights to drill on public land that all uh, amounts to a kind of subsidy for for fossil fuels. Um, you know anyone who and and there are other people who are sort of more expert on this but you know here in the united states we are still even though joe biden says he's committed to making a conversion to a green economy we are still you know subsidizing uh fossil fuel companies in various ways through tax breaks through um uh, you know a, a giving giving uh you know oil companies the right to drill on public lands um etc cetera, etc cetera, and not yeah. Charging them the uh, you know the, the the appropriate amount for that, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, and and this report was issued by like one of the major economic organizations in the world, um, and yet it was not covered by any of the corporate media. What organization was that? The, 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 the IMF, by International, the Monetary International Monetary Fund, Fund right? Is it issued by you know is it issued by the IMF? And it wasn't reported by any, um, uh, you know, major corporate media. Instead, it was reported by this tiny little, um, you know, online environmental news site, Tree Hugger. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, yeah, tree, treehugger.com is the is is the site um, that reported on it, um, right. uh, and 
that's just stunning, right? Because this is a story that was there for any reporter working for any kind of news organization uh, to report on, um, and they didn't. Well, um... So let yeah, the IMF report you know said eleven million dollars a minute. They the, the, it was uh, amounted to fifty nine. $5.9 trillion in subsidies in the year prior to the report coming out. And this is the IMF saying this. This isn't some group of radical, you know, environmentalists right. making this claim. This is the IMF. Right. Um, and yet it still wasn't covered. Right, right. Well, let, let's move ahead. We can always come back to uh, some of these issues because they're all related. Yes, um, they are. Project Sensors Research also talks about the increasing presence of microplastics worldwide, especially in the environment and in our bodies, and the implications of this for human and planetary health. So first, could you tell us what, what are microplastics, where okay. do they come from, and why do they pose a danger to the environment and our health? Okay, these are all great questions. So microplastics are tiny little, uh, you know, uh, bits of plastic that are uh, found in the environment, or in the environment that are created from the breakdown of all the plastic bags that we use, all the plastic containers we use. They are um, you know, less than a, in many cases, less than a millimeter um, in length or, you know, you know, or, or millimeter square. So they're not in some cases even really visible or that visible to the naked eye. Um, and they, um, you know, one of the stories that we spotlighted back in the, the, the list for 2021, 2022, that was published in State of the Free Press uh, 2022 had to do with this really sensational study um, that was done by some researchers in, in Australia that found that like 80% of the seafood that was available in super, a particular, particular group of supermarkets contained, right, um, certain amounts of microplastics, that there were little, you know, tiny microscopic bits of plastic in the clams that people were eating and the fish that were, people were eating, you know, and other, uh, other forms of seafood, yeah. which, you know, the researchers said, you know, was an indication that it, that these, that microplastics are much more you know, prevalent in our food chain than previously had been thought. Right, that people. I mean, they probably have been there for a long time, but people didn't 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 try to look for them. And there are concerns that microplastics might be linked to various kinds of health problems and diseases, including cancer. That there, you know, that there might be that they might be carcinogenic, or they might cause certain kinds of cancer. Right. Um, and after we put this on the list in um, in for the you know, the state of the free press 2022 the the 2021 2022 top 25 list yes. imme almost immediately after we published this book there was a spate of stories that that were even more alarming about the sh the the omnipresence of microplastics, and right. I and I know that they were reported on by the Guardian, and some of them were so out so so um, uh, stunning that they actually got um, significant corporate me corporate media coverage as well. Yeah. So one of them uh, was a was a finding that that um, in the tissue in living tissue of cancer patients, patients who were being treated for lung cancer, they had found um, microplastics in people's lung tissue. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they were more common in the tissue in the tissue that was cancerous than in the tissue uh, than the, and the healthy tissue that the that that the the researchers were looking at from people who were being treated for for lung cancer. And then the other one that got headline coverage even in USA Today and and yeah. in other in other corporate news outlets was that um, researchers had found microplastics in human blood <laughs> that they were studying human blood they looked at uh, you know some random samples of human blood and found 
a significant amount of microplastics in a significant number of subjects. So this kind of indicates that the, the you know, the, the product of the decomposition of the Coke bottles and the plastic bags and so forth that are, that we all use every day um, are now in our bodies. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah. we are not, and, and the scary thing is, I think, is that there hasn't been a huge amount of research about what the possible health effects of this are, but there are grounds for believing that it's, that, that it's a cause for concern. And why don't we hear more about this on the, on the corporate? Well, I mean, media? so that's a great question. Question. I'm going to go back to my example of uh, of Comcast. One of the people who sits on the uh, on on the board of directors for Comcast also sits on the board of directors for the parent company of Pepsi, <laughs> um, which is you know a major bottling company for Pepsi Cola. Right. Um, they're in involved in producing you know drinks and p packaged foods. I think the parent company of Pepsi is also involved in pa pa the packaged food and fast food industry. They, they use extensively plastic bottles and plastic packaging and so on. And, and you can imagine how um, terrifying it would be to advertisers, how alienating and how frightening it would be to advertisers if the corporate news media were consistently covering this because mo many of the at many of the advertisements you see, like for example, on television are for these fast moving consumer goods, right? Like right. fast food and soft drinks and beers and so on. They don't want to draw attention to the fact that these products are also contributing to the, to the, you know, the, the epidemic of microplastics in the environment. Right. Um, and there are many advertisers who actually have written you know policies in the contracts that they sign with, with with you know with the with the companies the the outlets where they advertise saying like I you cannot you know for example it's very common for car advertisers to say they do not want their ads to run before after or during like a piece about car accidents which you can understand right they don't want to be <laughs> they, they don't want to be associated with it well you could see if there were more coverage of microplastics you probably see soft drinks companies saying don't run my ad anywhere near a story about microplastics. So, so Steve, uh, we're going to have to start wrapping up, but I want to try and sure. tie this together in a couple of ways. First of all, uh, a listener of your could be listening and watching what you're saying, you know, even be concerned, but also wonder like, number one, what can I do about it? And number two, uh, we're living in a democracy. Mm -hmm. Um, Many people now, in light of the January 6th insurrection and other, you know, uh, election denying uh, spokespeople, I mean, what's the relationship between uh, the media and, and living in a democracy? And well, so why should we all care about all this and what, what could we even do about it? Okay, so those are really great questions, and it probably would be a topic for an entire another show yeah. <laughs> to, to really thoroughly answer yeah, them. Yeah. But let me just say, I think, you know, first of all, democracies are only as good as their sources of political information. Mm -hmm. A democracy without reliable sources of information about issues of public concern is a mm -hmm. farce, right? right. Um, and in fact, the founding fathers, right, um, saw it that way. That's why they they created the First Amendment mm -hmm. um, to protect uh, the press because they believed that the best guardian of a democracy and of the public interest was, uh, was, a, was a really... Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, a, a vibrant and robust, you know, media system and news media that would tell people the truth and inform people because democratic debate is only as is is only as good as the information that feeds it yeah. right that it's yeah. based on. So we it is a real crisis for democracy that um, our media, which is dominated by private corporations and big conglomerates who have all sorts of conflicts of interest yeah. um, are the ones that we have to rely on for information. Right. So I think the first thing that people can do is to seek out alternative sources of information, especially public interest media like your show here <laughs> um, that don't depend extensively on advertisements that are produced by people on a, on a non-for-profit non basis. More and more media is be 
is is going yeah. nonprofit. So here here in Chicago, mm-hmm. one of the major newspapers, the Chicago Sun Times, has now been become part of Chicago public media, the public broadcasting, uh, com- uh, the the public radio uh, company in um, in Chicago. Um, that's I think a good model. So we should be seeking out um, yeah. public service media and not for profit media because they're often more reliable. Right. And we should also be contributing our money uh, to organizations like yours, organizations like uh, you know Chicago Public Media in Chicago, ProPublica, you know, uh, subscribing to independent not non-corporate yeah. investigative journalism magazines and newspapers right. so that's one thing i think there are um i think that we should be pressuring our representatives to fund a larger public service media sector um, because our public television and public radio system in the united states is dramatically is woefully underfunded compared to say and, europe and I, I, um, I, or in asia i want i have to mention here that um even so-called public media such as right. npr and pbs they are not they are funded largely by the same yeah. corporations it, that we've I, been talking for, about th- so that in itself that. could could deserves a whole show yeah, uh, no, thank you for saying that because yeah. yes, BP and Exxon and Mobile are mm-hmm. the ones who fund a lot of like the, yeah. the programs that you see on, yeah. on public television. Right. So in closing, uh, I, I would like it if the engineer could show the project censored uh, URL and website once again, and also uh, Steve Masek's email address. Um, I'm mainly interested in uh, apropos of the project censored website right now is to how can people find some of these underreported stories uh of course they're in the project censored annual report but uh, i'm just wondering where else they could find those uh just briefly Stephen. so so if you go to the if you go to the project censored website projectcensored.org there is a link there to a number of independent news sources that Mm -hmm. we maintain a list um, of the of where we get a lot of the stories from that that end up on the top 25 and then there's also something called the validated independent news story blog the vins blog where in real time stories that are that have been nominated that will end up on you know or have a chance to end up on on next year's top 25 list yeah. will be posted short summaries of the stories Wonderful. with links to the original reporting so Wonderful. i encourage your viewers to Thank go you. to go to projectcensor.org. Wonderful. Well, let's see that's all the time we have for today. Uh but we'd love to have you back. Uh we've been speaking with Dr. Steve Masek, professor and chair of the Department of Communication and Media Studies at North Central College in Naperville, Illinois. We've been discussing Project Censor's research on media coverage of global carbon emissions, as well as on coverage of the impact of microplastics on the global environment and human health and much else. Again, you can reach Steve at, uh, again, uh, the email is s-h-m-a-c-e-k at n-o-c-t-r-l dot e-d-u. And you can reach Project Censored at projectcensored.org. Thanks so much for joining us today, Steve. We'd love to have you back again sometime Oh, it was soon. a real, real pleasure. Thanks so much. You're welcome. This has been Thinking Things Through, Critical Thinking for Critical Times on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Michael Sukoff. Please do contact me with your comments, suggestions, and criticisms at my email address. Again, if you could show it on the screen, it's Hawaii is calling at gmail.com. In other words, three words, Hawaii with two eyes, then the word is, and the word calling at gmail.com. And please do join us again two weeks from today at the same time, wherever you may be. Mahalo.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.